Hello, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to this um, very unique webinar that we decided to put together in conjunction with PIX. Um, obviously, it's a very concerning time for everybody in relation to the COVID-19 COVID um, pandemic that we're all facing at the moment. And we wanted to try and share some of our experiences uh, from around the world in relation to how we've been dealing with this, particularly in the context of congenital heart disease. Um, we have an international audience today and participants from all around the world. So we're very grateful for you uh, calling in. I'm really uh, honored to be hosting this along with my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Zia Jazzy, who will be well known to, to most of you um, from Sidra Medicine in Doha. Uh, we're also really uh, honored to have uh, Drs. Wei and Zhu um, from the West China Hospital in Chengdu uh, in conjunction with Dr. Peng, who, uh, spend some time in Wuhan, um, where, as many of you know, um, has really got a huge experience with dealing with, uh, with uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, we also are really honored to have uh, Dr. Emil Basha from Columbia in New York to share his experiences from a congenital surgical perspective. Um, we have Dr. Diam Sandarandam as well from Memphis, uh, who recently carried out a poll in relation to the impact this is having from uh, a catheterization or congenital intervention perspective. Uh, and uh, Sam, Victor Lucas, or Victor Sam Lucas from, um, uh, from Oshner in Louisiana, uh, who again is dealing with the consequences of the virus uh, in a hot spot uh, in a busy uh, congenital cardiac unit. So we're really grateful for everybody's participation. Uh, as you know, there is the ability to be able to uh, ask questions during this and we would encourage you to do so, uh, so that you can participate and we'll try our best to get to your questions. But rather than delay too much longer, uh, I'll go over now to uh, Dr. Zhu, who I think is going to present first um, from Chengdu. I'm really grateful for uh, our Chinese colleagues for calling in at such a late hour to share their experiences with them. He's going to talk about lessons learned, particularly from a critical care perspective and in relation to um, staff safety. Uh, so maybe over to you, Dr. Zhu. Yeah. Can you see my screen? So we can see you, but maybe we can't see your slide can share. Yes. Okay, wait a moment. I, I will share my screen, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, I, I'd say it'll come up now. It's, uh, it's just there we yeah. go. Yeah, okay, let's begin, okay. So uh, I'm Dr. Xu from West China Hospital of Strand University, and I am a cardiologist. My clinical focus is the management of patients with heart failure or arrhythmia at the cardiac device therapy. As I volunteer to support Wuhan, I have been working in the intensive care unit at the front line. So far, more than 200 severe patients have been admitted in our ward, and I do I do, have, do not have any potential conflicts of interest. Uh, first, uh, I, will I will introduce COVID-19 briefly. Uh, COVID-19 is a novel disease for all the doctors. The pathogen is a little coronavirus. It belongs to it belongs to the beta genus and it has envelopes and spikes. The diameter is from 60 to 140 nanometer. COVID-19 is sensitive to ultraviolet and, and the following three methods, but chloric acidine was ineffective. About transmission, COVID-19 is highly contagious for all the people. The COVID-19 is already highly contagious during incubation period with an average of 14 days. This is very different from SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus. The most common transmission is respiratory droplets and close contact. If you're exposed to the environment with a high concentration of COVID-19, aerosol for a long time, this will also increase risk of infection. Until uh, April 4th, the COVID-19 pandemic has been outbreak in over 200 countries and areas with over 1 million cases. We can detect COVID-19 in multiple specimens with the highest positive result in sputum 
Sam Rose and uh, Lasso or Sroza Sever. Next, uh, I will uh, talk about personal protection during COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Uh, the respiratory tract isolation at contact isolation is essential and N95 masks or surgical masks among medical workers. The homogenized prote protection methods should be emphasized in your whole medical team. Okay, this slide is very important. If the world plan for admission of patients with diagnosed with COVID-19, that means this world is a isolation world. And the, the standard class two or class three protection is required. The isolation ward should be clearly divided into contaminated ward, buffer zone, and cleaning zone. The left picture shown inside to outside include scrubs, N95 masks, and a disposal cap, first layer disposal shoe cover, disposal gown, goggle, first layer gloves, disposal apron. Second layer gloves, second layer disposal shoe cover. It usually takes half an hour to put this personal protective equipment on. Even if you are skilled, you, you will still need at least 10 minutes. Higher risk of expo exposure is anticipated when removing all this PPE, which also takes another 10 to 20 minutes. The left picture shows our standard uh, class three PPE. A dealing with a positive pressure headgear based glass to used in high risky operation. I put three PPE and performed tracking over protection and inadequate protection are both inadvisable. If the ward not planned for admission of patients that lost with COVID-19, protection is still important. It is hard to screen out patients during incubation or without symptoms in daily practice is contaminated and become a new source of infection. In our hospital, West China Hospital, the elective procedure was suspended during the peak of outbreak, only retaining emergent intervention. And early screening for patients with COVID-19 is very important, including active screening for patients with fever, cough, or other respiratory symptoms with unknown reason, and also routing epidemically, ep epidem epidemiological history taking is important. After the epidemic is controlled, the elective procedure restarted from one third of pre pressure's volume. Third part, I will talk about critical care considerations. <clears throat> Over 80% of COVID-19 patients are and mild status or without, with no or mild symptoms. Here are critical status with respiratory failure or to a different level. We should pay more attention to them. Symptoms should, would, symptoms would progress dramatically in some patients in these two groups, leading to a high mortality. But we could hardly identify these patients accurately in advance. The elderly or patients with underlying disease account for a large percentage in our confirmed severe or critic cases. Next, I will share a typical COVID-19 case with you. A female, 68 years old, admitted on February 10th. The chief complaints fever and cough for one week and have epidemiological epidemi history, um, history is positive with a hypertension for over 20 years, and the respiratory rate was 24 times per minute. 
uh, after high flow lazo cannular oxygen concentration reaches 50 percent and the symptoms got re exacerbated dramatically after six days respiratory still at 40 still over 30 times per minute okay so we can see the hypoxemia increased we performed tracheal trache intubation and medical uh, mechanical ventilation for this patient this picture shows uh, the extra test uh, on admission and six days after later sorry okay after 10 days of intubation and mechanical ventilation support the oxygenation was still hard to maintain and the deep dimer okay and the dimer level the dimer level elevated continuously echo test shows elevated um, pulmonary artery pressure and we find a we found a low onset tricuspid regurgitation tpa test so uh, we perform we perform the echo mode support for this patient uh, with adequate an anticoagulation therapy but the, the patient died of mold modes after 10 days of, of echo mode support complicated with severe ARDS, mechanical ventilation related pneumonia, hypercoagulation status, acute pulmonary embolism, intractable hyperlactosidemia, and septic shock. And reviewing the whole treatment, we found that the mechanical ventilation can effectively correct the hypoxemia. However, the, sec the severe carbon dioxide retention become intractable. Here you can see the this is a hypo, uh, di hi hyper uh, hyper carbon dioxide. Okay, next. So respiratory distress is the prominent symptoms of critical patients. Moderate sedation and okay. analgesic treatment help to improve some spontaneous breath and the respiratory support treatment could effectively relieve respiratory distress. Mechanical ventilation could improve oxygenation, but hypercapnia is common after respiratory support treatment, partly related to uh, inhibition of spontaneous uh, breath, but the, real, uh, the, the exact reason is, is unknown. Intractable and severe carbon dioxide retention uh, usually it's uh, hard, hard to treat and we can consider consider the extra corporeal uh, carbon dioxide removal therapy okay and extra carbon uh, carbon real uh, extra corporeal carbon dioxide removal should be considered which is uh, less invasive lower risk and cheaper compared to vv ecmo but the blood flow only one tenth of ECMO. So the pressure of carbon dioxide falls by 20 to uh, 20 to 30%. Uh, the ABG showed uh, the pressure of carbon dioxide fails from 87 to 24 after ex extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal therapy for this patient. Another lesson is abnormal coagulation is common in severe COVID-19 patients. The dimer was an independent risky risk factor of an in of in hospital death. So adequate regulation therapy should be initiated for severe COVID-19 patients if otherwise contraindicated. Uh, about antiviral interventions, okay. And so far, no specific hmm. uh, antiviral therapy against the SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus and COVID-19 have been proved. Recently, a trial of lopilavi and ritolavi in adults with severe COVID-19 uh, publicated in New England Journal of Medicine. The result is negative also. Another question is about corticosteroid. Use of corticosteroid use of corticosteroid is still controversial only considered for patients with rapidly progressive
degeneration of oxygenation, radiology, imaging, and excessive inflammation. We must shorten treatment period to three to five days and limit the, uh, the doses no more than one to two milligram per kilogram per day. Finally, I will give some uh, conclusion, take home message. All populations are susceptible to COVID-19. Intensive precautions are essential. Respiratory tract isolation and contact isolation are main protection measures. Severe and critical COVID-19 cases account for around 20%. Supportive treatment of organ and systems are principal. Carbon dioxide retention is common after mechanical ventilation. Extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal or ECMO should be considered if the retention is severe. Combined edge coagulation should be initiated if there are uh, there is no indication. So far, no specific antiviral therapy against COVID-19 has been proved. Routine use of corticosteroid is not recommended. And that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zhu. That, that was a very comprehensive and extraordinarily useful um, reflection of the invaluable experiences that you've learned in China with your battle uh, through this, and we're very grateful. What we might do is just proceed on to your colleague, Dr. Wei, now to talk about the cardiac specific uh, impacts of the disease. And then once we come back, we'll, we'll open it up for more broad questions, if that's okay. So, yeah. Dr. Wei, would, would you be willing or able to uh, share your presentation with us? and? Uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, well, can you see uh, the screen? Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, mm. Then I'll talk about uh, the role of car uh, cardiologists uh, in this uh, uh, the, uh, this situation. Um, um, I'm I was working uh, in the uh, uh, clinic center of Chengdu city. Uh, so I share some experience uh, of my work. Um, you know, I I work in the uh, ICU uh, ICU wards and. Uh, uh, I um, I work with the uh, severe patient, but some some mild and moderate patients. Uh, in fact, we have to we have to check about this kind of patient. So every day we will um, uh, to screen the patients in the mild and uh, mild and in the ward from the wards for uh, mild and moderate patients. So we use uh, this uh, uh, this score to uh, to screen or to recognize the potential critical patients, and th this is uh, so we will um, appoint some doctor and uh, a nurse to uh, check the patients if the patient got enough score uh, risk score, and we will trans uh, transform the patient to the uh, 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 to the ICU ward. Jiafu, okay, Dr. Okay, it's okay, uh, because I don't know how to uh, close this small window. Uh, the small window's okay. We, I mean, most of it, it's, it's, we can see it. It's, it's, it's good enough. Okay. Um, so, uh, in the, uh, in the ICU, um, every day we have to check the, uh, check the vital signs and the oxygen satur satur uh, saturation also. And after uh, blast and set and then electrolytes. And another important, uh, um, results, uh, I, 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 um, emphasize is the booming because most of the patients are old patients and this kind of patient are lack of nutrition because of this problem, this disease. And if the abdomen is low and the intraval 
intravascular volume is very low. So we have to compensate this this booming for this kind of patient. And this can reduce the effusion of the uh, infusion in the lungs. Another uh, important uh, examination is the chest X-ray and CT scan. From every patient in the ICU will check the X-ray every day. And if the patient gets uh, severe, and uh, we'll check the CT, uh, CT if the, con the situation is uh, okay. And uh, we'll uh, record the volume input and output every day. And how, um, the, the, we'll, we'll record the weight for each patient. And we'll test the chopping and the BMT and or anti pro BMT for, for each patient. If the patient got a severe situation, we'll check that every day. And we'll check the uh, echocardiograph for the uh, severe patient and the ECG. And the volume management, management is very important for this kind of patient. In fact, because most of the critical cases got chopping and uh, BMP elevated. And, uh, and this, this patient with uh, ARDS, most of them have to use cortical steroids. And this drug will increase the uh, increase fluid, uh, fluid return, um, um, increase the flu, uh, the volume, blood volume. And the, this kind of patient, most of the patients are elderly, and uh, most of them got uh, hypertension or heart failure or coronary heart disease. So the kind of patient, the heart function is very is fragile. So keep volume balance is very important. Um, for uh, for the mild and moderate moderate case, we have to keep the volume balanced, and for the uh, a crit case, we'll we'll keep the absolute negative volume because the negative volume is uh, um, essential for the uh, for the heart failure, also for the ARDS, and we use the uh, use volume records and use echo. Uh, to, to measure the imperial uh, valve cover and also to monitor the weight to check if patient got uh, uh, got uh, um, uh, too much too much uh, uh, blood volume or not. This is a patient, uh, eight, uh, eighty-one years old patient. He present uh, presents uh, with uh, indigestion and abdominal pain, and the patient did. Uh, not got a uh, fever, also got a cough or other symptom, but uh, the uh, general doctor uh, 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 pres uh, prescribed a CT scan to check if the patient got uh, this condition or not. And we found the lesions in lungs. And also we do a, um, we did a, a PCR test and found that that's positive. And the for the first week, the, the patient in the hospital, we didn't find the patient didn't complain any discomfort or not discomfort. But on the ninth day, on ninth day, the patient complained with cough and perspiration, also got the display, severe display, and the body temperature is uh, uh, thirty-seven, and we uh, check the um, blood count, blood cell count is. Uh, uh, increased and the lymphocyte count decreased and the CRP increased and the interleukin 6 also rose to 100, 147. So this, uh, this test showed the patient uh, got a severe, uh, severe inflammation and uh, the anti, uh, anti pro BMP also increased but the uh, troplenty is normal. And because of the bad uh, oxy uh, oxy uh, oxygenation, so we did we did a CT scan for this patient, and we found the uh, severe lesions in the lungs. <clears throat> Consider this because of the um, progressive progressive uh, uh, inflammation in lungs, <laughs> and also we check the echo at the same time. I could show the patient the LVEF is normal, but the uh, inferior, um, inferior valve cover increased and the rate of collapse in less than 
and this is also got to uh, uh, increase the pulmonary artery pressure. And for this patient, we changed the, the oxygen support to a uh, high flow oxygen and also oxygen to, to a pro position, pro position. And because of the antivirus, in fact, uh, is not for this patient. So we stopped the, stopped the, the antivirus therapy and we add the antibiotics. Also, we add the um, message uh, pre um, this solo, and we got we also give a globin for this patient. With this, this treatment lasts for uh, five days. At the same time, we give a lot, um, give a, uh, diuretics for this patient, and also we uh, we have tried the uh, hydro um, chloro uh, queen for this patient. And the, uh, the uh, diuretics, we give a uh, big dose for this patient. We want to keep the negative volume, uh, negative volume, volume balance. And we can find along with the treatment, the anti-pro BNP uh, get gradually uh, get down uh, sharply. And the situation also uh, recovered very fast. And about uh, several days, the CT, you can see the CT scan, the lesions absorbed or not. Another problem for the, uh, the, this, this kind of patient is that we have to prepare the fibrinators and pacemaker for this kind of patient. Because the drugs at the early stage, we, we give a lot of uh, antivirus drugs, but this kind of drugs, most drugs could induce the, uh, the coating travel in, uh, in uh, nonsense. And they also um, get the patient got to AV block. So that we have to prepare some, some, um, some fatal arrhythmia for the kind of patient. And uh, we, we have uh, uh, treat the patient with uh, non coating facts. And lidocaine uh, is a kind of important drug for this kind of patient. And also a temporary uh, pacemaker also uh, is very important. This is a patient aged uh, 84 years old, female, and the patient received hydroxychloroquine. And you can see the patient got a severe, uh, severe bradycardia. And uh, that day the patient experienced uh, First, the uh, ventricular fibrillation and heart arrest. And during CPR, we found the, uh, the ventricular fibrillation was factory to the fibrillation. And in this patient, we gave lidocaine uh, from, for the fourth, the fifth uh, defibrillation, and the defibrillation was successful. After that, we gave a pacemaker for this patient. So because of the, uh, the world, we have no condition to do the uh, temporary um, pacemaker in, uh, by the X-ray, <laughs> but we can use the echo to guide, the, uh, guide this uh, procedure. This, this, this the echo show, show the uh, electrode, for, electrode in the right ventricle. And this is the electrode in the uh, in, an inferior, um, Vela cover, and this is great for the uh, electrolyte. And the, this kind of patient, most patients will got palmar hypertension, in fact, and uh, this could be due to the severe RDS and hypo, hypoxemia. So um, we have no the, the, uh, nitric oxide, in fact, we have no drug, so I have no uh, I have tried, I have want to use this drug, I think this, this could be helpful. So if, the, if you have this uh, drug uh, available, you can try this, this, this drug for the patient. Um, we give a, uh, give a mirror renal for this kind of patient because the uh, pulmonary hypertension and also patient got a um, heart failure. So we, we can, so we can, we'll give this patient Oh, sorry. Um, 
the patient patient will got a heart uh, heart failure with preserved EF. But uh, if you give, uh, we found in some patient we give after we give a meal renal for this kind of patient, the situation will get better. So if you have no if you have no uh, nitrous oxide for uh, to donate the pulmonary artery, you can try this drug. And for the patient with shock, um, of course, no uh, no epinephrine is uh, the first line first line drug. But we found some kind of patient, this drug is not effective effective to uh, to maintain the blood pressure. So the uh, vessel pressing this can this vessel pressing is very important. Um, so. Uh, if they, uh, if we can, we'll consider use this drug together to to maintain the blood pressure. And dopamine, in fact, uh, the guidelines do not recommend the, the dopamine. But I think in some patient you can try if the the first two drugs have no effect or you not feel like enough, you consider this drug. Uh, some team for two anti fork. You know, in the, the world, we found the Maglas says or mask for the uh, for the uh, for the shear shorts. You will find the fog is very, very uh, um, bad for for vision. So you can consider use this to use a tape to stick on the upper of the uh, mask to block the, the to stop the uh, steam from the upper border and induce the fog. But before that, you have to use some notion to perk your face. This is our team. Uh, uh, the red guys from West China Hospital, the white guys from the Public Health Clinical Center of Chengdu. And that's all, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Wei. That, that, that's great. Maybe if I could bring in Dr. Peng at this stage. Uh, Dr. Peng, uh, obviously you've been involved as well. Could you give us maybe the three biggest or best lessons you've learned from your experience in dealing with patients with COVID-19 in the clinical setting? Yes, thank you, Dr. Penny. Uh, I just come from, uh, ju just come back Wuhan and uh, I hope to share some interesting viewpoint or experience when I work in Wuhan. Uh, we know uh, several papers have published and we uh, um, focus on the cardiac injury uh, in this uh, COVID-19 treatment. But uh, in fact, when I worked in Wuhan, I found that many people maybe have heart dysfunction uh, because I have uh, given the test for BNP or anti BNP for these people. Uh, I found uh, there are more people have the higher uh, anti probion level than the uh, cardiac troponin, uh, such as we have a, a small sample study. We include about 19, uh, 90 uh, patients uh, with the COVID-19. Uh, COVID and uh, we found about uh, 23 patient uh, with uh, increased uh, anti BNP level, but only 10% with uh, uh, cardiac troponin uh, increased. So I think the, the um, cardiac uh, dysfunction maybe is more common than cardiac injury, but uh, uh, at present, the publication is not very uh, pay attention to, this, uh, to, to, to the cardiac dysfunction about these people. Uh, this is the first. And another, we found that uh, some patients have the uh, heart dysfunction, uh, uh, but uh, this patient does not have the cardiac injury. Um, we also give the echocardiography for this patient with a higher anti probiotic level, uh, and we found that the ejection fraction is normal. So I think the half PIF maybe should pay attention for this patient. Uh, there are some reports about the SARS uh, in uh, 2003. We also found that uh, many patients with virus pneumonia will have heart failure. And uh, this heart failure always with uh, uh, normal uh, or preserved uh, ejection fraction. So uh, I think this is, uh, should be pay attention about these people. 
Uh, another one is, uh, I think the intermediate care room maybe is helpful for us uh, because we know uh, in Chengdu is no problem because there is only a little number about the COVID patient, patients. But in Wuhan, there are many huge number of the COVID-19 patients. There are no, no enough uh, ICU or CCU bed for this patient. So the intermediate care room maybe help us. In other words, uh, when I work in Wuhan, the Hubei General Hospital is a uh, special designed for treatment of COVID-19 by government. We, uh, we do not have ICU or CCU, but we have the intermediate care room. Uh, if the patient should uh, need the respiratory support or the circulation support, we will translate this, this patient into the intermediate care room. Uh, when this, this patient improved, we will step down and uh, put this patient get out. So I think uh, if we have a huge number of this patient, uh, and uh, we also lack of the healthcare resource, the intermediate care room maybe is very useful for us. And uh, the last I will share is, uh, um, oh, I think after the experience from Wuhan, uh, we still know little about this virus. This virus is quite different from the uh, previous, uh, previous respiratory virus. Uh, it uh, break the uh, break me uh, break uh, break the common understanding of the respiratory virus because he maybe have a very long duration of the virus shading, such as the the, the patient as I show the the picture. Can you see uh, the patient? Uh, 20, uh, 30, uh, 32 years old male. We can see from the onset of fever and to the last time the patient have the positive PCR test. It's a very long time, maybe more than 50 days. Uh, always we think a uh, respiratory virus cannot have, ha have this uh, long duration of virus shadings. So this virus is a, is a very new, very special for us. We also, uh, we always know little about this virus. And uh, this long duration of virus shading uh, maybe tell us we should think about the how long the time of the isolation and how long a time or we should we also uh, we, it will also give the, a new challenge on the management of this virus. Another one uh, in my experience is uh, antivirus treatment is always ineffective um, such, uh, such as uh, uh, Abidodo uh, and other drugs, um, in, in my experience, I think it's not very effective. Uh, but for some um, severity, uh, patient with severity pneumonia, maybe the glucocorticoid maybe have some help for this patient. Uh, uh, Dr. Peng, do you mind maybe if I ask you, a lot of the participants or uh, attendees yeah. in the uh, webinar have an interest in patients with congenital heart disease. Did you see yeah. any either children or adults in your hospital who had pre-existing congenital heart defects who were affected by the virus? Uh, sorry, uh, please pardon. Uh, you see the, the, the children or the adult patients? Yeah, yeah children or adult patients who had uh, congenital heart disease were born with holes in their heart or were born with abnormal valves being affected severely by the virus. Ah, sorry. Uh, Xiao Xiong, can you help me out? I didn't hear Sorry, I'm going to translate this sure. uh, in Thank Chinese you. to Dr. Pan. He said, if you have any questions, have you had any questions or questions? Because this is a questions, he said, if you have any questions about the treatment, have you had any questions about the treatment? Have you had any questions about the treatment? Have you had any questions about the treatment? Sorry, sorry, I, 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 I haven't met this patient. But I met some patients with, uh, I, I think this virus may be more aggressive for the elder patient with uh, cardiac uh, complications or cardiac uh, uh, medical history, such as with uh, hypertension or 
with um, diabetes mellitus or coronary artery disease or with uh, coronic, uh, coronic heart failure. Yeah, but I haven't met the uh, congenital uh, heart disease. Yeah. Well, that's extremely useful and thank you very much. I might bring in Dr. Basha at this stage. Um, again, Emil, uh, probably it seems that children seem to be less severely affected by the virus than maybe the elderly population. And the greatest challenges we've faced in the congenital heart world has been how do we manage our service uh, in the context of the risk to staff and the concern and reconfiguration affairs that happen on the adult side but still keep our patients safe. Could you, uh, um, you know, we share our, uh, you know, sentiments with you in New York at the moment. It's, it's very difficult for you, but we really appreciate your insight into that. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Damien. Um, well, the prevalence in New York is very high. So the things we've had to do here may not apply to places which have less of a lesser prevalence, but uh, we have seen on the congenital side, um, it's true that children are much less affected than adults. So in ge generally speaking, the PDI, our children's hospital has seen very much fewer patients with COVID than the adult side. The adult side is completely overrun with COVID patients, is full with COVID patients. On the, the children's hospital side, uh, the NICU is relatively free of COVID and our infant cardiac unit is relatively free of COVID. Our PICU uh, has had to receive some adult um, patients with COVID just because there were not enough beds on the adult side. For the congenital patients, um, the, you know, um, we have stopped doing any elective procedures as most of you know. And so the difficulty is how you triage patients and who do you actually uh, proceed with uh, in the setting of uh, very few PPEs and, and not enough resources, not enough nurses, uh, our OR nurses have been redeployed. A lot of the anesthesiologists have been redeployed. So we are down to one OR and one OR team. Uh, that's it. So that's one first difficulty for congenital uh, heart disease uh, doctors. How do you triage surgical or catheterization cases? So the you know there's some obvious ones. Any baby on PGE that's being born. Um, will receive, uh, you know, whatever treatment they, they, they need. Any, any emergency uh, is done. We have had, we have three status 1A patients waiting in-house for a heart transplant. And we're doing one this afternoon, actually, one of those three. So we are continuing with these uh, patients. But the middle range is difficult. So that's the tetralogy of Fallot, that's six months old. Uh, that's, uh, you know, not, not spelling, but has a high gradient, or that's the VST that's not growing and that's uh, going into heart failure despite, uh, you know, maximal medical therapy, can, can I can trust me, 21, uh, that's going into, uh, that's having increased symptoms. So all these patients, it's very difficult. And the way we have it done uh, at our hospital is there's one central uh, committee who decides on all these cases. And, uh, and we have to submit for every case, we have to submit a request to go to, which the committee includes the hospital director, which, under, which knows what kind of uh, uh, resources we have. Because, you know, I may not know exactly from my vantage point what the entire hospital has for resources available in terms of PPE and nurses and so forth. So we submit to a central place and we get uh, our request, uh, you know, approved or not. We have to explain why that particular patient has to go now and why it cannot be delayed. But it's, it's complicated. How do you, you know, it's really, there, there are no objective criteria to choose. Uh, and do you do that on a daily basis, that triaging system on a daily basis, uh, Emilio? Yeah, that's, that's every day. I mean, we try to set up a, uh, a week uh, of, of surgeries. Um, and so, you know, last week we did uh, one or two cases a day. That's compared to four to six cases a day. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, or an, an activity that's down, down to about 20% of, of uh, our normal, 20 to 25% of our normal surgical activity. Having said that, again, I think pediatrics is spared somewhat. And on the adult side, adult cardiac surgery is down to zero, essentially. They do 
maybe the aortic dissection that comes in, uh, but they, they have done no sur even though it's a very big program, they've done no surgeries in the last week. Uh, finally, there's the worry that the post-op infections. So we, there are reports, I know from another hospital, and we have that of patients <clears throat> getting infected who came in for heart surgery for whatever reason and then get infected while in the hospital. And those patients don't do very well. I mean, the few patients that I know about have not done great with, with that problem. And you are screening all of your preoperative patients within 24 hours? Correct. So we are bringing in for, all, for every patient going, well, every patient admitted to the hospital, no matter for what reason, is getting a test right now. This is new for about a week ago. The hospital uh, ramped up testing capability very quickly. And so everybody's getting tested. Uh, for the surgical patients coming from home, we test them the day before. Uh, that we get, we test them in the morning. We get the result uh, midday, and so we know what's you know what's going on. And for the surgeons and for the surgical team, everybody for us is wearing N95 masks during the procedures. That is not. Uh, I know of other centers in the U.S. where that's not the case. Um, where they wear regular masks, but again, the prevalence here is maybe higher, and so we we feel that for protection of healthcare workers, we should uh, we mandated that for every surgery you have to wear an N95 mask. Well, what have you done with your ICU? Have you corned off a section that you try and you know reserve for your cardiac patients and try and keep it as clean as possible? We you know, we have tried, but again, I think the, the onslaught of this whole, uh, of the virus was so extensive that uh, even though we tried to do that, there were too many patients coming in over the last week or two. And so that's where the uh, regular pediatric cardiac ICU had to take adult COVID patients, you know, like young adults, 25 year old, 30 year olds, but intubated. Uh, and so as much as we tried, it wasn't really possible. The only place that is somewhat uh, restricted now is the our infant cardiac unit. But here the problem is, that's where the babies go, but here the problem is what a lot of babies are now being born to COVID positive mothers. And so those babies are considered uh, under uh, PUIs, per, uh, patients under investigation, and we need to test them. And I don't think that we know yet uh, exactly what the um, uh, whether vertical transmission from infected mom to baby occurs. I, I'm, I'm not aware that we know the answer to that yet. So all these babies are considered, you know, potentially infected. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a small uh, paper from The Lancet looking at, I think there was eight or nine pregnant moms where there was no report of any vertical transmission from uh, positive moms. But as you say, it's still uncertain. And um, you, you mentioned just that there's potentially a document coming out uh, from the surgical standpoint, um, trying to help in the triaging of which patients should and shouldn't be done. Could you maybe just share some of that experience? Yes, absolutely. So we, uh, we, last week, uh, a group of surgeons from the U.S., uh, including uh, myself, uh, Joe DiRani from the uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, 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 um, Dr. Overman uh, from Minnesota and others, uh, put together a paper talking about triaging and in general how to manage uh, pediatric cardiac surgical teams, including rotating surgeons so that they, uh, they don't uh, overlap and they hopefully stay healthy. Um, and that should be coming out. That's, that was accepted for publication in the three main surgical journals, that is JTCVS, Annals of Thoracic Surgery, and the um, World Journal of Congenital and Pediatric Cardiac Surgery. So it should be coming out any day. And <clears throat> we have an extensive table about a list of cases uh, and how to consider which case. <clears throat> but even you will see that the, the table and the paper still leaves a lot of room for interpretation about the triaging. It's just not something that is a pure science. Sure. Well, thanks, Emil. What I might do now is just bring Shyam in uh, to share his experience from a cath perspective. Uh, Shyam and a group of his colleagues had um, put together a um, questionnaire that maybe some of you participated in, in relation to what we should be doing with our CAF patients and has developed a, a statement document through the SCI. Sham, thanks for sharing that with us. 
Uh, thank you, Damien. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hijazi. Um, so I, I'm going to talk uh, talk briefly on the impact of COVID-19 on congenital cardiac catheterizations, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, so as you all are aware, uh, the COVID-19 affects the adult uh, or the elderly uh, patients. So uh, SCAI came out with this uh, uh, document for cardiac catheterization for the elderly patients, particularly patients who come in with STEMI. And uh, uh, yeah, if you are COVID negative or if you're not a uh, person of interest or uh, patient under investigation, then you can go for a primary PCI. But otherwise, everybody is now getting lytic therapy. So they are getting fibrinolysis more than uh, PCI. So they came up with nice treatment algorithms. Uh, similarly, uh, the Journal of uh, the, the American College of Cardiology uh, and Sky put together some uh, consideration during the pandemic, mostly for adult patients. Pretty much every society, this is a recommendation for hemodialysis patients. Um, so every society has put up recommendation that we felt maybe for congenital cardiac catheterizations, we need to come up with some recommendations. So this uh, paper just got published today. So it's April 9th is when it got published. And uh, a group of uh, congenital cardiac uh, interventionists got together. We wrote this paper on resource allocation and uh, decision making for the pediatric and congenital cardiac catheterization during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, mostly focused on the United States. So based on this, we made several recommendations. The first recommendation is how do you preserve resources uh, during a pandemic? The most important, as Dr. Emil Basha alluded to, is postponement of elective procedures and kind of use PPE is very judiciously. The next is to minimize uh, exposure risk, especially to not only to the patients, but also to the staff working in the cardiac cath lab and elsewhere within the hospital. Uh, and as the pandemic worsens, the third step is resource reallocation and repurposing, which means we are going to get adult cardiac patients, uh, or sorry, adult patients in the children's hospital, taking care of uh, COVID patients in the children's hospital. Uh, we are even, some centers are also considering changing cath labs into negative pressure isolation rooms, which can be used as uh, intensive care units. Uh, and uh, lastly, as the pandemic really worsens, uh, and since many of these cardiac catheterization procedures are not uh, performed, uh, Many centers are reassigning interventional cardiologists and other uh, staff members to work in adult ICUs to take care of COVID-19 patients. Now, going back to triaging which patients require a heart catheterization during this pandemic, uh, we came up with some recommendations up to uh, uh, based on a tier system. Uh, just like Dr. Basha said for cardiac surgeries, we have made this recommendation for uh, cardiac catheterization. Uh, every hospital now has this kind of a, a board. So each patient uh, that needs to be uh, coming to the cath lab has to be presented to a board. And the board members decide whether or not the procedure is uh, urgent or emergent. And we felt this would be a good guide for centers uh, to decide to make the decision making for cardiac catheterization. For example, if you are in tier 1A, that includes urgent pericardiosynthesis atrial septostomy for transposition of great arteries, atrial decompression for hyperplastic left heart syndrome, and so on and so forth. Um, and 1B uh, is patients who are awaiting cardiac catheterization uh, in the inpatient or cardiac surgical operating room uh, or in order to be discharged. So based on this uh, tier system, we have made some recommendations as to who comes to the cardiac cath lab. And uh, uh, we also, uh, came up with uh, a, a nine-point uh, summary of what our responsibilities should be during a pandemic. Uh, as, as everybody has talked about, the adult patients are affected more than children. So we still have to be very responsible uh, uh, and take appropriate measures to protect our staff and uh, uh, mitigate the spread of the virus. Uh, I'm just going to skip all this, and but uh, I'm just going to go to point eight and nine. I think point eight is to maintain open communication links between centers and webinars like these are very useful so that uh, we learn from each other uh, as the pandemic worsens. Uh, and every institution should have a contingency plan because if physicians and other healthcare workers contract the virus and the workflow is minimized, then uh, 
having a plan in place uh, is very essential. I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, because we sent out a survey uh, to all the interventional uh, cardiac uh, catheterization doctors, uh, mostly in the United States, to see how their resources are being reallocated. So the survey uh, responders were from 85 centers, 14 were outside the United States, and we uh, divided the centers in the United States based on how uh, critical their uh, healthcare system is affected. So the counties which have more than 2,000 COVID-19 positive cases uh, were grouped into one. So there are 27 centers or 48% were in, from the high risk counties and then uh, about 52% were from the lower risk counties. And this was made by the using the Johns Hopkins Resource Center, where they actually show you exactly which cent, which places are affected the most. For example, the worldwide there have been 1.5 million confirmed cases. The United States is almost getting to a half a million uh, confirmed COVID-19 patients. Majority of the patients are uh, concentrated in the Northeast, uh, in the New York uh, metropolitan area, but other centers like Detroit and New Orleans are being um, affected a lot. So we wanted to see how a healthcare center in New York differs from, let's say, a center in um, Kentucky. Um, anyway, the, the, the questionnaire uh, was answered by uh, mostly uh, operators from children's hospitals who are adjacent to an adult hospital. Uh, about 25% uh, were freestanding children's hospital, and about 20, another 25% were combined adult and pediatric cardiac cath labs. Most of these uh, centers, uh, about one third of them, are performing more than 700 cases uh, routinely each year. And here you can see the breakdown of the uh, patient volumes per center. As of April 1, 2020, all the 56 centers that we polled have canceled all elective procedures. And the majority of the cancellation have happened after the uh, CMS recommendation on March 18th where they recommended all elective surgeries should be delayed or postponed. Uh, it was interesting that uh, about 45% of the centers uh, do have a multidisciplinary committee that have been established to review the candidacy for potential upcoming cath lab cases. And uh, if you look at uh, centers who are in the higher COVID-19 positive counties, uh, they have this more consistent, about 58% versus the lower COVID-19 positive cases, there are about 50% have these kind of committees. Now, uh, this uh, table shows which ca cases should be, uh, are canceled. Uh, for example, ASD device closures. Uh, this column has centers located in counties with high positive COVID-19 rates. And this is centers with low positive COVID-19 rates. 100% of ASD device closures are now being canceled in the United States. PDA closure greater than six months of age, almost 100% have canceled. Uh, however, PDA closure in premature infant uh, are still being performed uh, in um, centers in the United States. The other interesting fact is uh, pulmonary valve replacement for pulmonary insufficiency pretty much has been canceled. Whereas for conduit stenosis, the replacement of pulmonary valve is still about 50% are being performed at the moment. Uh, pre glen catheterization, if you are in a high volume COVID-19 center, 85% uh, have been canceled, whereas low volume centers have not canceled pre gland cardiac catheterization, only 42% have canceled their uh, pre gland heart cats. Uh, AICDs are still being uh, performed, ductal stents are still being performed uh, in the United States right now. Uh, this is an interesting question. We asked uh, in the last month, how many of your staff performed a simulation of uh, doffing and donning of PPE equipment uh, while taking care of a COVID-19 patient. Uh, only about 30% uh, of the centers have actually done simulation. And among these 30%, 46% uh, of these were in the centers who have the higher uh, COVID-19 positive patients versus 10% of the centers uh, uh, who are in the lower risk category have done these simulations. And if we asked uh, uh, why the simulations was not performed, uh, most of them have not considered simulation, but many of them have, do not have adequate PPEs to, uh, available for a simulation. 
Now, uh, we asked the question about how many cath labs have been converted to a negative pressure room. Uh, only 10% of these cath labs are converted to a negative pressure room in case uh, you have to treat a COVID-19 patient in the cath lab. And then we asked uh, how many uh, doctors have actually performed a procedure in a COVID-19 positive patient or a, a patient under investigation. Only 5% of doctors have done that. Uh, it's actually three responders. Uh, two were uh, balloonated septostomies on patients born with uh, COVID-19 positive parents. And one was a pericardiocentesis uh, performed on a nine-year-old who had myocarditis and a large pericardial effusion uh, who was COVID-19 positive. So those are the three procedures done so far in the United States with COVID-19 positives. Uh, about 80% of the centers do have uh, enough uh, uh, PPE for treating COVID-19 patients. And uh, availability of PPE, um, I think more than 50% think that currently they have enough PPE, but the, the PPEs are at limited supply. Uh, we asked a question, what is the practice about screening patients for COVID-19 patients? Uh, uh, majority of the centers are only screening patients who have symptoms. Uh, only 15% of the centers are screening every patient coming to a procedure prior to a procedure. Uh, almost 75% uh, of the uh, responders said that uh, the interventional cardiologist's uh, work call schedule has been changed. Uh, what many centers are doing is only one interventional cardiologist will work per week. So the other uh, uh, interventional cardiologists are taking uh, or are redeployed for other purposes. So the, the call schedules have been changed. And so has the staff members have been changed. Uh, about 45% of the cath labs have uh, decreased staff just to minimize risk and sometimes because of reduced case volumes. Uh, cath lab staff pay has not been affected so far in the majority of the centers, but many centers fear that uh, cath lab staff may get less uh, paid less during this uh, crisis. And uh, about 10% of the physicians have now been reassigned in a, a clinical service that is outside of their typical scope of practice. And uh, many uh, physicians do think that they will be reassigned uh, shortly, about 45% of the physicians think so. And same for the cath lab staff, about 25% of the cath lab staff have been reassigned uh, for other purposes besides congenital cardiac catheterization. Uh, whereas uh, others are, I think, uh, being discussed for reassignment. So this is kind of the results of the survey, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Sham, that, that, that's great work, and well done for, for taking the lead on that. What I might just do now, uh, in the interest of time as well, and we'll come back, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, is maybe just bring Sam uh, Lucas in from New Orleans. You had mentioned that New Orleans was a bit of a hot spot. Sam, maybe you could share some of your experiences and how you've had to reconfigure your services in a, uh, a, a joint service uh, for how you're dealing with or looking after kids and adults uh, and maybe let us know, uh, you know, how you've managed your service since things have kicked off. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Damien, for inviting me and, and Jihad for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Um, our practice profile has been very much like Sham described. Um, we've got a run rate of about 20% on the cath side and the surgical side relative to normal times. We've continued to do uh, newborn uh, premature PDAs and the urgent cases as Sham described, and we submitted data to that. Um, in terms of rearranging the service, Damien, you know, our, our service is, we're, we're within a hospital. It's a very, very large adult system with <clears throat> 20 plus hospitals and more than 100 clinics, and we're a relatively smaller component of that. What we have done is try to uh, limit the exposure of each cardiologist by having a single cardiologist tend to a single center. For instance, our newborn center is off campus by two miles. And what we've done is, um, uh, you know, uh, Ivory, we've had him cover that hospital that's two blocks from his house and try to limit the number of doctors that go into the NICU and, and limit the number of uh, exposures for each individual provider. On the clinic side, we have a, an interesting construct in that our cath team actually does some clinic work as well. And so what we tried to do initially was to have our cath team not involved in the clinic activities, again, to limit the number of staff involved in the activities. 
it's become necessary to change that over time as, as the uh, number of adult patients in the crush on the adult side has increased. So we've deployed about 25% of our nursing staff to the adult side. Um, and, and my comment on that is that's a very interesting process, how you go about that. And you learn a lot about um, individual person's risks for uh, disease and, and sickness with the disease. So we've tried to take a very carefully considered approach to deploying our nursing staff to the adult side. We did early on look at segregating um, our patients as uh, I think uh, was described from Columbia that we have, uh, our units are divided into two basically with about 20 beds on either side. And we have cohorted all the cardiology patients to the CVICU side and, and actually offered to turn over the PICU side, but it hasn't been necessary to do that. We've constructed about 100 ICU beds in different places throughout the hospital that has actually been adequate. Have you, Sam, have you identified key staff? I mean, there are some people, and, and maybe Emil can weigh in on this, you know, one of your scrub nurses in theatre uh, who you've developed a relationship and really is a very important part of the team. Have yeah. you been able to identify key workers in certain point and say, look, these are protected, not that we don't want to contribute, but, you know, they're just too yeah. vital to our service? Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Um, we have looked at it in a way of uh, who has a job that only they can do, you know, even though we employ 20 plus nurses, um, not all of them do the same thing. So for instance, our EP nurse who does the home monitoring system, we've tried very hard to not redeploy her to the adult side because if we lost her, we're, we're really at a little bit of a loss to be able to do the device management um, at, you know, from the office. And in fact, we've kept her at home for most of the time doing that. Um, our cath team sort of falls into what you're saying that we've tried not to deploy the cath team to different places. And this includes me and Ivory, you know, we've on the interventionalist side, we've of course volunteered up front to work in the COVID ICUs and to help with the dialysis catheters and central lines and things like that. But we haven't needed to do that, um, which I think is good. And in this uh, rotation of interventionalists, um, we actually did that for a single case. We've had a couple of uh, acute carditis cases and, and both have had uh, complete heart block and, and extremists. And so uh, we don't typically do this, but we had a single interventionalist go into 10 to one that was gonna be set up for ECMO and put in the lines and things like that. But it, it, I would say fortunately didn't need ECMO and, and recovered well. So that's an eye towards limiting the exposure to staff. That's great. Emil, has that been similar in, in Colombia whereby you know key, key personnel have been protected from being redeployed? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, like uh, what what Dr. Lucas was saying, um, the mo mo most most often the person who can do who's the least expandable will stay behind. So, for example, amongst the, so we have three congenital heart surgeons at Columbia, and we discussed amongst ourselves that uh, you know the most junior one would go first if there were if there was need for redeployment, then the second one, and I would go last, uh, being the oldest and the person who sort of get, could manage any case that came in. Uh, and the same thing is true for other, other specialties, cat lab, nurses, and so forth. Uh, the doctors, so, I mean, we, we haven't, uh, I mean, a lot of doctors have volunteered. I, I well, everybody volunteered, uh, but they didn't take everybody. Uh, they took general surgeons first and people who had more of an inclination towards ICU work and, and residents and fellows have been um, massively redeployed because they're closer to still, and including pediatric cardiology fellows. I think uh, there's several of them who are redeployed in the ICUs on the adult side. Um, but uh, it's, you know, so, but uh, nursing has been the biggest challenge for us in terms of who is needed uh, and things like transporters, like transporting patients. And so we had a call out for secretaries and office staff to see whether they would be interested to volunteer to transport patients. Uh, so those are the things that you don't really think about. Doctors, there have been uh, enough doctors to cover the need, but it's more uh, other, other areas. Great, w what I might try and do is just bring back in some of our Chinese colleagues, just on I think on two points that are certainly relevant to us here. And one, Dr. Um, Wei or Dr. Zhu, when you were talking earlier on, uh, I was very impressed by your pictures on the personal protective equipment and how uh, vigilant you had become. And that statistic that over 50,000 workers in, in Wuhan and, and zero, none of them had been infected. I mean, it's just astounding. Can you share with us how you were able to achieve that? Sorry, I beg your pardon? I'm just, it, so this is... 
to Dr. Lastenus. Yeah. Dr. Zhu, yeah. The, you showed a slide of, of the personal protective equipment, uh, you know, level two and level three. And I think you, sh yeah. you shared some data suggesting that you had a very low or non-existent rate of infection of healthcare workers as a consequence of, of employing that strategy. Can, can you maybe share just a little bit more with us how you were able to achieve that? Because I think a lot of us outside of China are struggling with being able to you know, ration our personal protective equipment. Okay, I think the, the, the uh, first important is the way should the law, if the world is planned to, for admission of patients diagnosed with COVID-19. So for this uh, uh, world, we must divide it into three parts, three areas, very, very important. That means contaminated world, contaminated world, buffet room, at cleaning room. All the staff work in the cleaning room. If you need to get into the contaminated latent ward, you should uh, first get into the buffer room and uh, entrance to the contaminated ward. This uh, clearly uh, divided a uh, different area, makes the, the COVID-19 was uh, isolated. This, this is very, 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 very important one. Another, uh, Another important uh, thing is we need a standard personal protection equipment. It's standardized in China. All the doctors, if you want to get interest into the isolation world, especially when you want to get into the contaminated world, you must wear the standard per personal protection equipment. It's many, many things, scrubs, N95 mask, Disposal cap, double layer disposal shoe cover, double this uh, double layer disposal uh, uh sorry, sorry double layer gloves, and it's, and it's so on, and so this is standard um pro uh, to protect our staff, and the last things you need to make a very clear uh requirement. Is especially when the staff get out of the uh, contaminated ward, you will you 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 need to um, uh, get off or remove this personal protection equipment. It's very 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 risky at this uh, moment. It's a higher so for, at this moment you should do all the things in the buffer room slowly, one by one. Very, very carefully, and after you do, you remove all the personal protection equipment. You you need to a shower over thirty minutes in our cleaning room. After that, you can go on your work. Everything, have dinner. Everything. So this standard protection and uh uh uh. Uh, 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 uh the uh, flow, uh, protective flows is very, very important. And the, I, I think it's useful. Yeah, so we can got uh, nearly 50,000 uh, doctors and nurses. There's zero uh, contaminated. That, that's phenomenal. Um, you, you mentioned for level three, you've got positive pressure head. Uh, for level three protective yeah. equipment, you have positive pressure helmets or, or headgear? Yeah. Um, I, I, can I just ask Emil, Sam, Shaim, have, and, and Z, have you, have you had exposure to that? Have you had any training in that? I've not seen that in, in our hospital. We I'm have, sure Emil does. Yeah, we Emil. Web -based uh, we, we have, I mean, uh, look, I'm not an expert, but uh, we have N95s, uh, head cap, uh, and a gown and gloves and and foot uh, coverage and that's it. We don't do. I mean, as far as I know, we don't do the double uh, layer or or certainly not the positive pressure masks that uh, that uh, Dr. Zhu has shown. Uh, can I though ask? I mean, uh, the fifty thousand without an infection. Frankly, I have to say I'm a little bit dubious just because it's such a large number of doctors and nurses and no, none of them being infected is almost difficult to believe. Um, 
is this since you implemented that double and triple layer or the whole time? Because I have personal friends of mine in China who told me that doctors and nurses were infected and in fact died in Wuhan uh, from coronavirus. So that doesn't jive so much with that information. Okay, uh, I can show some uh, points. Uh, just before I got, to, uh, I volunteered to the Wuhan. There is some uh, doctors and nurses uh, get infected. But after we volunteered to Wuhan, uh, the, the, the government um, clearly asked all the doctors and nurses to wear a standard personal protection equipment. From that, there's no infection. Okay, so since and you so, And that's... class three, a protection. Yeah. Okay. And, and the class three um, personal protection equipment is useful, but we don't wear. Uh, anytime. If only when we uh, will do some high risk operation, we will use it. Is, is intubation considered high risk operation? Yeah, intubation and some, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 tracheal ectomy. Tracheal ectomy. Okay. Tracheostomy. Yeah. 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 Um, could, Dr. Peng, you, just could I bring you in a little bit here in relation to uh, testing? Uh, it's been a bit of a contentious issue, I think, both on an international, national level and even in, in, in specific healthcare systems and hospitals. How did you, did you have a very wide testing uh, policy in your hospital uh, or in Wuhan while you were there? Mm -hmm. Or was testing restricted for patients where there was uh, clinical symptoms uh, present? Uh, I think the uh, the nuclear acid uh, test uh, about the uh, PCR or RT PCR maybe is is very uh, uh, how to say uh, maybe will have many uh, false negative results. We can see a picture. I will show you, show show for you. Uh, sorry, how to, yes, just like this, my picture, this. Yeah, we have a almost 20% minimum uh, false negative rate with the PCR test as well. Uh, yes, I, 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 I don't know, we can do you have to see the picture? My... No, no, we can't see it, you might just need to share your huh. screen. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, because I... I found so many patients will have the false negative uh, results, uh, but uh, still, uh, only uh, only uh, very small patients will have the uh, false positive results. So we we will do so many uh, tests, uh, PCR tests, uh, for the patient again and again. When the patient uh, discharge, we will have the uh, nuclear acid uh, PCR test at least twice uh, in different days. So this is just uh, to avoid the uh, false negative, uh, false, uh, negative uh, results. We also can uh, know from some reports about the patient uh, after discharge, he will have the positive result again. Uh, we call this a recurrent, uh, recurrent positive or converse positive results. Uh, I think this may be the, the this is a false negative uh, result. So when we uh, treat this patient, we should uh, pay attention about the false negative uh, test result. Yeah, uh, I have some patient about the uh, just like uh, the the false negative results, and uh, in this patient will. Uh, may be interesting, but I uh, sorry I cannot share our. Here we go. It seems to be coming through. Can, now. You, share, uh, can you see? Yes. 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 Yeah. We can see the, 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 these three patients. Uh, they all have a very long duration of viral shading, and the last one. This is a, a thirty-two years old guy. We can see from the onset of the fever and to the last time we have the positive taste, it's a very long time. This is, this is very different from the previous uh, uh, respiratory virus, so it's very special. We can see the result about the PCR. Oh, 
negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So if some patients will have just two times negative, they will discharge. But maybe this, this patient just have the first negative results. Maybe he will infect other people. So this, uh, this situation makes the very difficult and make a challenge for us to how to prevent the, the infection and uh, how long the duration of isolation should be gave the patient. Maybe this is a new idea for us. Wow, that, that's scary. Um, can I just bring maybe uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Way back in? There's been uh, some concern touted uh, regarding the impact of ACE inhibitors and um, maybe angiotensin receptor blockers. The congenital heart disease patients are, are, are probably exposed to those medicines more than, uh, than maybe some other medicines. Um, and I wonder, Dr. Uh, Doctor, uh, if Dr. Wei could comment on whether he feels there's any data to support the use of or the exclusion of ACE inhibitors uh, uh, in this pandemic. Sorry, I'm going to translate this. <coughs> okay, um, for this question, um, because um, we know this, we, uh, we got this information that ARB and ACI could uh, uh, get to the situation reverse. So we, uh, in our strategy, we uh, stopped all the ARB and the ACI for the patient with the hypertension because we can change this because most of patients uh, mm, we do not we have to use ARB and ACI. In fact, we can or most of them we can change it to uh, diuretics and uh, CCB. So most of patients with hypertension we change it to ARB and ACI, but only one patient because that patient got uh, a severe hypertension and we. Uh, uh, we add uh, uh, ARB to this patient, but after that, the patient got a uh, severe situation again. So we do not know if this, because of that drug or not. But uh, in our, our, our experience, um, we also recommend to stop this drug because not because this drug is not uh, uh, compared with the risk or the potential risk, we think we, we could consider I stop that after the still up still the uh, the problem resolved. Great, um, Z. Maybe I could bring you in now. Uh, just obviously, you uh, are in a very significant leadership role uh, within your healthcare institution. Uh, could you share some of your experience about the impact and your role yeah. with that and how you know what you've had to do? Thanks, uh, Damien. Thank you. So uh, it's actually it's a problem because we have uh, COVID cases in the country, but we don't have it at Sidra Medicine. And the major problem we're facing is the limitation of the testing kits. You know, there's a finite number that we can import from outside to test everybody. So right now, we have been selective on who to test when we admit to the hospital or for surgery. And we said that, okay, if the patient requires surgery or if they have symptoms, we will test them. But today I was meeting with our infection control uh, director, Dr. Simon Dobson, and we may be able to change this policy so that we can test every patient that gets admitted to the hospital, but use the test that has the turnaround four to six hours, because there are two types of tests at least for now, the rapid test, which you will get the result within the hour, and then the uh, other routine tests that will uh, will be available four to six hours. So I think majority of the cases can wait for four to six, and we have enough number of kits to use this test. But the rapid test, unfortunately, we have very limited supply, and that's where the issue. So uh, that's what we are doing, at, et cetera. So fortunately, as I said, we don't have any pediatric patient at Sidra that is COVID positive. 
Um, that, that, that's great. Just on that, maybe, Emil, to bring you back in, uh, in larger metropolitan areas, and I know the US is slightly different in how it runs its healthcare service, but is there an argument to be made for identifying one paediatric service or hospital within a large metropolitan area and trying to ensure that that hospital is kept COVID negative and then you get on business as usual and operate rather than having five, six centers in the city all trying to do the same thing and struggling with it? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, that's the idea situation. Uh, particularly in New York should have had that. Um, there have been some informal discussions about this and some of it has been done. Both on the side that, I mean, we, we're the uh, largest center in, in the New York, uh, in the tri-state area, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. And so we have been getting a lot of babies from centers that have sort of shut down. But this has been done not on a for, in a formal official way. Uh, one of our intensivists did try to kick that up towards the state, the uh, state of New York, and to see whether there was some interest. But I think they were overwhelmed and congenital heart disease was not really on their on their <laughs> uh, top of agenda deal with so yeah. so didn't really get anywhere with this but so it, it's kind of an informal thing um as far as i know no pediatric cardiac center in the region has officially closed down saying we're not taking anybody but in practice a lot of the smaller centers have had basically their icu beds taken away uh by the sheer you know, at the scale of, of the COVID uh, invasion. So they really can't do much. And also we have reached out, I mean, I have personally reached out to CHOP and to Boston Children's in order to send patients there that we couldn't do because we were uh, at one point for a few days, we were really struggling to even do any, any surgeries. Uh, you know, they themselves have had their own issues with PPE, with uh, uh, closing down for elective surgeries. So we have uh, offered this to parents and so a few parents have uh, chosen to do that. So I know if one family got in the car and drove to Houston because they have family in Houston and uh, had having, uh, VSD closure at Texas Children's, another family w went to Boston Children's uh, for Glenn. Uh, on their own accord, you know, they just drove there and, and did that. Right. But I thought, Emil, that if people <laughs> drive from New York and go to Boston via yeah. Rhode Island, uh, they, they were being caught and they're put in quarantine or something. Yeah. Uh, was that a problem for you guys? Well, I mean, I, it, uh, you know, I don't know in practice how much that was done. And uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to, to the, I don't know the family that actually drove the family went to Houston, uh, left before, they left very early in the, during this, so that was before oh, the I quarantine. See. Yeah. When they went to Boston, I don't know what happened to them exactly, um, and whether they were stopped or not. Yeah. The question I have for the, uh, the team, especially from, Wuhan, you know, from China, uh, let's say that now you guys opened up and everything and COVID is behind us. Going down the line now, are we gonna be start testing for this virus routinely? before any operation or are we gonna, uh, you know, uh, forget uh, all of this and life as normal? Uh, uh, Emil, what's your thought? And then our uh, Chinese colleague, what do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, just based on what our CEO and COO were saying, we're moving to uh, antibody testing uh, next week. Uh, so not the PCR based, but antibodies and, and uh, starting with, yep. You know, all patients, but also all healthcare workers at the hospital at some point. Right now, it's all symptomatic yes. workers. Hopefully, next week, the week after, there will, it will be all healthcare workers. And I, I mean, again, uh, completely outside my specialty, but I think it ha it's going to have to be done widely, population-based, to have an idea about who's immune, who's not. But maybe the guys, the, the colleagues from China, have a better idea. Okay. Maybe Dr. Zhu, could you comment on that? Because you mentioned that, you know, you've uh, on your presentation that you initially moved to a third of your previous volume of cases and now you're back to normal. Are you st still screening everybody? Are you still looking for the virus? <clears throat> yes, uh, we do like this. First, uh, 
Um, all the patients uh, for the elective uh, intervention will do uh, a, a very carefully uh, history taking about the epidemiology and we will test uh, uh, for the CT scan. I think CT scan is more sensitive for um, many patients uh, to suspect you for coronary uh, uh, COVID-19. But if, if the CT scan is abnormal, we'll do the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 test and also. And uh, uh, next is uh, to, uh, we will do a very carefully personal protection. And uh, I, 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 I will, we will also do the antibody based test uh, about uh, one month ago. And are you looking for IgM? Yeah. For active IgM, infection? IgG. Yeah. I can we? I know we've run a little bit over, but there are some questions from the audience. Uh, Brian Bow from Nationwide in Columbus has just uh, been on and asked, um, can anyone comment on the immune response in patients who have recovered from COVID-19? Are patients getting reinfected? Have you had any experience with that? I don't think it's known yet, to be honest. That's what's discussed at the hospital leadership uh, level and with, uh, with our hospital uh, infectious disease, disease experts. And basically they say, we don't know yet uh, whether you're gonna have a chance of reinfection, whether you're completely immune or not. I don't think it's known. Yeah. And what about, let's say you have been infected, Emil, you may not get reinfected yourself, but you could still become a vector, I presume, um, particularly if you're shedding for 50 days. Um, I, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I know that the, the, we have, for example, two surgeons that have been infected and they, once they tested negative, they were let back into the hospital mm. on one test. Uh, I, I, you know, I think it was one test, uh, but they also had IgG. It had the uh, serology test also. Okay. And there's an, another question, just uh, maybe again to our Chinese colleagues, um, maybe Dr. Zhu, because I think you discussed about it. How long um, are the shifts in the contaminated rooms? So for the staff who are working in your contaminated rooms. How long are their their shift, their working shift? Okay, uh, not more than four hours, mostly. But if in the emergency uh, situations, up, we were up to six to eight hours. For example, last patient, we uh, do the echo, perform echomotherapy. We, we stay a long time in the contaminated world over six hours. Okay. Can I ask the uh, results with ECMO in, in China? How were, was it VV ECMO mostly or VA ECMO? Yeah, VV ECMO is my first. Yeah, VV ECMO. But we, we do not choose VV ECMO firstly. For the patient, if the patient is with a very severe hypoxemia, we will do VV ECMO firstly. If the patient is uh, uh, due to the hyper carbon dioxide, we will perform the extra peripheral carbon dioxide removal therapy firstly because it's more easy. But once you go on VV ECMO, what's your chance of surviving in, in your experience? Uh, actually, uh, uh, all the patients lead, uh, if the patient lead a VV ECMO, I don't think it's a very high uh, surveillance after that, but it's uh, still very important uh, chances for them. You try, but the chances of surviving are very low. That's what you're saying. Is that what you said? The chances of survival are very low. If you go uh, on. Yeah, about uh, half to half. Yeah, 50%. Okay. Um, just one more question um, for Dr. Wei. Uh, what dose of hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax was used for adult patients um, when, you, when, you were, uh, when you were starting that treatment? Uh, in fact, this uh, uh, this drug we use the in several patients, but uh, one patient uh, one patient received uh, five days, and the patient experienced uh, a bradycardia. So, uh, same time we stopped all the treatment of the also in the other patients. So, um, so in fact, we do not have enough insurance on this drug. But um, because this this patient, in fact, this several patient, 
only got the PCR positive, but in the country, the situation in fact is um, good. So, so we don't think we should, we don't think we need to get that risk just to get the PCR negative. But we think the important is the, uh, we turn the patient, the patient's uh, situation and get the patient recover, not the PCR in fact. Okay. So this, I think this drug um, do not uh, effective for like the other antiviral drugs do not have enough evidence to, could uh, help the uh, the treatment of this this uh, disease. And uh, just finally, in relation to the myocarditis that sometimes accompanies this virus, is there any specific targeted therapy you think that helps? What was is there one thing that you feel is, is beneficial in relation to the heart versus the lungs. I know they're intricately related, but with myocarditis, is there one thing that you would advise people to use? Nigga,小熊,你可以翻一下吗? 那种矛盾的地方，呃，在如果就是你怎么去平衡这个心肺之间，如果用药的话，如果心脏也有损害的话，呃，in fact it's a uh difficult uh, situation. We found some patients, severe patients, uh, most of the severe patient got to uh pulmonary hypertension. In fact, but the left ventricle and left atrium is a lack of uh, a blood uh, infect, and this kind of patient will got uh, um, no blood pressure. So the, this uh, kind of patient, um, the right ventricle got uh, um, uh, over uh, volume, in fact, but the left ventricle got a uh, lack of volume. So I think the most okay. important treatment is the dilate the pulmonary artery so we should we can we we have to try uh consider to use the uh um oxide the the oxide but we have no this drug available so we have tried the um uh, uh, uh no sorry uh mil um for the this drug or uh uh could uh, dilate the pulmonary artery in fact this 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 drug could uh, increase the blood pressure, but uh, uh, from the mechanism, this drug have no effect to increase the blood pressure. So we consider this could be due to the dilate the pulmonary artery and get the blood to can uh, cross the palm the lungs to the left atrium. So, uh, so for this kind of patient, but we for this kind of patient, we should still. Um, reduce, remove the, uh, remove the, uh, the water or fluid in the lungs. So for this kind of patient, we try to uh, infuse in the abdomen to uh, to increase uh, the uh, intravascular volume. But uh, at the same time, we'll give the uh, uretics to reduce the effusion. So. Um, but at the same time, we'll give a, 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 a low epinephrine to, to maintain the blood pressure. Okay. Okay. So Thank guys, maybe I'm really grateful. The, the, uh, the, we've gone a little bit over, uh, over time, but I think it's a very uh, emotive and evocative and pervasive issue for all of us. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody involved. I'd like to thank all our participants uh, who've given up their precious time in a very difficult situation. Uh, uh, we particularly appreciate our colleagues from China. We congratulate you on the efforts that you put in place to be able to stem the tide of the virus. And we all hope we'll be able to simulate uh, the results that you've had there. Uh, I'd particularly as well like to thank uh, Elizabeth from Venus MedTech who's uh, helped support this and Burke and the team from Z Events. Uh, in being able to support the uh, the webinar uh, from a technical perspective. Um, Z, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, you said everything. You know, again, we want to thank uh, specifically Venus Medtech for educational grant as well as Elizabeth for her time 
and efforts here as well as uh, the event for uh, working with us, especially Esra and Gouache. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks to all the speakers. And we wish you all continued good health. Uh, it's a time whereby it comes with a little bit of guilt as we see our colleagues uh, becoming and friends becoming unwell. But we wish you and your families uh, stay well, stay safe. And thanks for your continued work for uh, looking after the patients that are so precious to us. And hopefully we'll have a, maybe a follow up uh, at some point in brighter times uh, uh, to talk about uh, maybe the next challenge that will inevitably come with this. But thanks to everybody and uh, happy Easter from, uh, from Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Easter, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.